Chapter Five of My Doggy and I by Robert Valentine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter Five: Conspiracy, Villainy, Innocence, and Tragedy. In one of the dirtiest of the dirty and disreputable dens of London, a man and a boy sat on that same dark December night, engaged in earnest conversation. Their seats were stools. Their table was an empty flour barrel, their apartment a cellar. A farthing candle stood awry in the neck of a pint bottle, a broken-lipped jug of gin and water, hot, and two cracked teacups stood between them. The damp of the place was drawn out, rather than abated, by a small fire, which burned in a rusty grate over which they sought to warm their hands as they conversed. The man was palpably a scoundrel, not less so was the boy slaga said the man in a growling voice we must do it this very night well brassy i'm game replied the slogger draining his cup with a defiant air if it ain't been for that old ooman as was caretaker all last summer continued the man as he pricked a refractory tobacco pipe we'd have found the job more difficult but you see she went and lost the key at a back door and the doctor he had to get another so i goes and gets round the old ooman and pumps her about the lost key and at last i finds it d'ye see but returned the slogger with a knowing frown seems to me as how you'd never get two keys into one lock eh the new one wouldn't let the old un in would it ah that's where it is replied mr brassey with a leer as he raised his cup to his large ugly mouth and chuckled you see the doctor's wife she is somewhat timorsome and looks arter to locking up every night herself very particular then she has all the keys up in her own bedroom o' nights so you see in consequence of her uncommon care she keeps all the locks clear for you and me to work upon the slogger was so overcome by this instant of the result of excessive caution that he laughed heartily for some minutes and had to apply for relief to the hot gin and water however did you come for to find that out asked the boy servants replied the man ha exclaimed the boy with a wink which would have been knowing if the spirits had not by that time rendered it ridiculous yes you see continued the elder ruffian blowing a heavy cloud of smoke like a cannon shot from his lips servants is variable in character some is good and some is bad i mostly take up with the bad uns there's one in the doctor's house as is a prime favorite with me and knows all about the locks she does but there's a new one unexpected difficulty sprang up in the way in this very morning what's that demanded the slogger with an air of a man prepared to defy all difficulties they've been and got a dog a little dog too the very worst kind for kicking up a row however it ain't the first time you and i have met and conquered such a difficulty you'll take a bit of cat's meat in your pocket you know all right exclaimed the young housebreaker with a reckless toss of his shaggy head as he laid his hand on the jug but the elder scoundrel laid his stronger hand upon it come slogger no more that you've had too much already you won't be fit for duty if you take more it's very hard on a cove growled the lad sulkily brassy looked narrowly into his face then took up the forbidden jug and himself drained it after which he rose grasped the boy by his collar and forced him struggling towards a sinkful of dirty water into which he thrust his head and shook it about roughly for a second or two there that'll sober you said the man releasing the boy and sending him into the middle of the room with a kick now don't let your monkey rise slogger it's all for your good i'll be back in half an hour see that you have the tools ready so saying the man left the cellar and the boy who was much exasperated though decidedly sobered by his treatment proceeded to dry himself with a jack towel and make preparations for the intended burglary 
The house in regard to which such interesting preparations were being made was buried, at the hour I write of, in profound repose. As its fate and its family have something to do with my tale, I shall describe it somewhat particularly. In the basement there was an offshoot, or scullery, which communicated with the kitchen. This scullery had been set apart that day as the bedroom of my little dog. Of course, I knew nothing of this, and what I am about to relate at that time. I learned it all afterwards. Dumps lay sound asleep on a flannel bed, made by loving hands, in the bottom of a soap box. It lay under the shadow of a beer cask, the servant's beer, a fresh cask, which, having arrived late that evening, had not been relegated to the cellar. The only other individual who slept on the basement was the footman. That worthy, being elderly and feeble, though bold as a lion, had been doomed to the lower regions by his mistress as a sure protection against burglars. He went to bed nightly with a poker and a pistol, so disposed that he could clutch them both while in the act of springing from the bed. This arrangement was made not to relieve his own fears, but by order of his mistress, with whom he could hold communication at night without rising, by means of a speaking tube. John, he chanced to bear my own name, had been so long subject to night alarms, partly from cats careering in the back yard, and his mistress demanding to know, through the tube, if he had heard them, partly also from frequent ringing of the night bell by persons who urgently wanted Dr. Matugal, that he had become callous in his nervous system, and did much of his night work as a semi-somnambulist. The rooms on the first floor above, consisting of the dining room, library, and consulting room, etc., were left, as usual, tenantless and dark at night. On the drawing room floor, Mrs. Matugal lay in her comfortable bed, sound asleep and dreamless. The poor lady had spent the first part of that night in considerable fear because of the restlessness of dumps in his new and strange bedroom, her husband being absent because of a sudden call to a country patient. The speaking tube had been pretty well worked, and John had been lively in consequence, though patient, but at last the drowsy god had calmed the good lady into a state of oblivion. On the floor above, besides various bedrooms, there were the night nursery and the schoolroom. In one of the bedrooms slumbered the young lady who had robbed me of my doggie. In the nursery were four cribs and a cradle. Dr. McTougall's family had come in what I may style annual progression. Six years he had been married, and each year had contributed another annual to the army. The children were now ranged round the walls with mathematical precision, one, two, three, four, and five. The doctor liked them all to be together, and the nursery, being unusually large, permitted of this arrangement. A tall, powerful, sunny-tempered woman of uncertain age officered the army by day and guarded it by night. Jack and Harry and Job and Jenny occupied the cribs, Dolly the cradle, each of these creatures had been transfixed by sleep in the very midst of some desperate enterprise during the earlier watches of that night, and all had fallen down in more or less degazé and reckless attitudes. Here a fat fist doubled, there a fatter leg protruded, elsewhere a spread eagle was represented, with the bedclothes in a heap on its stomach or a complex knot was displayed, made up of legs, sheets, blankets, and arms. Subsequently, the tall but faithful guardian had gone round, disentangled the knot, reduced the spread eagle, and straightened them all out. They now lay, stiff and motionless as mummies, roseate as the morn, deceptively innocent, with eyes tight shut and mouths wide open, save in the case of Dolly, whose natural appetite could only be appeased by the nightly sucking of two of her own fingers. In the attics, three domestics slumbered in peace. Still higher, a belated cat reposed in the lee of a chimney stack. It was a restful scene, which none but a heartless monster could have ventured to disturb. Even Brassy and the slogger had no intention of disturbing it. On the contrary, it was their earnest hope that they might accomplish their designs on the doctor's plate with as little disturbance as possible. Their motto was a paraphrase. Get the plate, 
quietly if you can, but get the plate. In the midst of the universal stillness, when no sound was heard save the sighing of the night wind or the solemn creaking of an unsuccessful smoke curer, there came a voice of alarm down the tube. John, do you hear burglars? Oh, dear, no, Mum, I don't. I'm convinced I hear them at the back of the house, tubed Mrs. McTougall. Indeed, it ain't, Mum, tubed John in reply. It's only that little dog as comed this morning and ain't got used to its new home yet. It's a whining, Mum, that's what it is. Oh, do get up, John, and put a light beside him. Perhaps he's afraid of the dark. Very well, Mum, said John, obedient but savage. He arose, upset the poker and pistol with a hideous clatter, which was luckily too remote to smite horror into the heart of Mrs. McTougall, and groped his way into the servants' hall. Lighting a paraffin lamp, he went into the scullery, using very unfair and harsh language towards my innocent dog. Pompey, you brute! The footman had already learned his name. Hold your noise! There! He set the lamp on the head of the beer cask and returned to bed. It is believed that the poor, perplexed dumps viewed the midnight apparition with silent surprise and wagged his tail, being friendly, then gazed at the lamp after the apparition had retired, until obliged to give the subject up, like a difficult conundrum, and finally went to sleep, perchance to dream of dogs or me. It was while Dumps was thus engaged that Brassy and the slogger walked up to the front of the house and surveyed it in silence for a few minutes. They also took particular observations of both ends of the street. All serene, said Brassy. Now you go round to the back and use your key quietly. Give him the bit of meat quick. He won't give tongue arter he smells it, and one or two barks won't alarm the house. So get along, slogger. When you've got him snug with a rope round his neck and his head in the flannel bag, just caterwaul and I'll come around. Bless the cats. They're a great help to gentlemen in our procession. Thus admonished, the slogger chuckled and melted into the darkness, while Brassy mingled himself with the shadow of a pillar. The key, lost by the caretaker and found by the burglar, fitted into the empty lock even more perfectly than that which Mrs. McTougall had conveyed to her mantelpiece some hours before. It was well oiled, too, and went round in the wards of the lock without giving a chirp, so that the bolt flew back with one solitary shot. The report, however, was loud. It caused Dumps to return from Dogland and raise his head with a decided growl. Nobody heard the growl except the slogger, who stood perfectly still for nearly a minute with his hand on the door handle. Then he opened the door slowly and softly, so slowly and softly that an alarm bell attached to it did not ring. A sharp, bow, wow, wow, however, greeted him as he entered, but he was prompt. A small piece of meat fell directly under the nose of Dumps as he stood bristling in front of his box. And, let me add, when Dumps bristled, it was a sight to behold. Good dog, good dog, said the slogger in his softest and most insinuating tone. Dumps reduced his bark to a growl. The footman heard both bark and growl, but attributing them to the influence of cats, turned on his other side and listened, not for burglars, innocent man, but for the tube. It was silent. Evidently, tired nature was, in Mrs. McTougall's case, lulled by the sweet restorer. Forthwith, John betook himself again to the land of Nod. "'Have another bit?' said the slogger, in quite a friendly way, after the first bit had been devoured. My too trusting favorite wagged his tail and innocently accepted the bribe. It was good cat's meat. Dumps liked it. The enormous supper with which he had lain down was, by that time, nearly assimilated, and appetite had begun to revive. Going down on his knee, the young burglar held out a third morsel of temptation in his hand. Dumps meekly advanced and took the meat. It was a sad illustration of the ease with which even a dog descends from bad to worse. While he was engaged with it, the slogger gently patted his head. Suddenly, 
Dumps found his muzzle grasped and held tight in a powerful hand. He tried to bark and yell, but could produce nothing better than a scarcely audible whine. His sides were at the same instant grasped by a pair of powerful knees, while a rope was twisted round his neck, and the process of strangulation began. But strangulation was not the slogger's intention. He had been carefully warned not to kill. "'Mind you now, don't you screw him up too tight,' Brassy had said when given the boy his instructions before starting. "'Dogs is worth money. Just hold him tight and quiet till you get the flannel bag on his head. Then stand by till I've sacked the swag.' Accordingly, having effected the bagging of the dog's head, the young burglar went to the door, holding Dumps tight in his arms, and uttered a pretty loud and lifelike caterwaul. Brassy heard it, emerged from the shade of his pillar, and was soon beside his comrade. When Dumps smelt and heard the newcomer, he redoubled his efforts to free his head and yell, but the slogger was too much for him. Few words were wasted on this occasion. The couple understood their work. Brassy took up the lamp. "'Very considerate of him to have a light all ready for us,' he muttered as he lowered the flame a little and glided into the kitchen, leaving the slogger on guard in the scullery. Here he found a variety of gins and snares, carefully placed for him, and such as he, by strict orders of Mrs. McTougall. Besides a swing bell on the window shutter, similar to that which had done so little service on the scullery door, there was a coal scuttle with the kitchen tongs balanced against it, and a tin slop pail in company with the kitchen shovel, and a watering pan, which, the poker being already engaged to John, was balanced on its own rows and handle, all ready to fail with a touch. These outworks, being echeloned along the floor, rendered it impossible for an intruder to cross the kitchen in the dark without overturning one or more of them. Thanks to the lamp, Brassy steered his way carefully with a grim smile. At John Waters' door, he paused and listened. John's nose revealed his condition. Gliding up the stairs on shoeless feet, the burglar entered the dining room, picked the locks of the sideboard with marvelous celerity, unfolded a canvas bag, and placed therein whatever valuables he could lay hands on. Proceeding next to the drawing-room floor, he began to examine and appropriate the articles of virtue that appeared to him most valuable. Not being a perfect judge of such matters, Mr. Brassy was naturally puzzled with some of them. One, in particular, caused him to regard it with frowning attention for nearly a minute before he came to the conclusion that it was worth money. He placed the lamp on the small table near the window, from which he had lifted the ornament in question, and sat down on a crimson chair, with gilded legs, to examine it more critically. Meanwhile, the slogger, left in the dark with the still, fitfully struggling dumps, employed his leisure in running over some of the salient events of his past career, and in trying to ascertain, by the very faint light that came from a distant street lamp, what was the nature of his immediate surroundings. His nose told him that the cask at his elbow was beer. His exploring right hand told him that the trap was in it. His native intelligence suggested a tumbler on the head of the cask, and the exploring hand proved the idea to be correct. Brassy was very hard on me tonight, he thought. I'd like to have a swig. But Dumps was sadly in the way. To remove his left hand, even for an instant, from the dog's muzzle, was not to be thought of. In this dilemma, he resolved to tie up the said muzzle, and the legs also, even at the risk of causing death. It would not take more than a minute to draw a tumbler full, and any dog worth a straw could hold his wind for a minute. He would try. He did try, and was yet in the act of drawing the beer, when my doggy burst his bonds by a frantic effort to be free. Probably the hairy nature of his little body had rendered a firm bond impossible. At all events, he suddenly found his legs loose. Another effort, more frantic than before, set free the muzzle, and then there arose on the still night air a yell so shrill, so loud, so indescribably horrible, that its conception must be left entirely to the reader's imagination. At the same instant, Dumps scurried into the kitchen, the scuttle and tongs went down, 
the slop pail and shovel followed suit also the watering pan into which latter dumps went head foremost as it fell and from its interior another yell issued with such resonant power that the first yell was a mere chirp by contrast the slogger fled from the scene like an evil spirit while john waters sprang up and grasped the pistol and poker the effect on brassy in the drawing-room cannot be conceived much less described he shot as it were out of the crimson gilded chair and overturned the lamp which burst on the floor being half full of paraffin oil it instantly set fire to the gauze window curtains the burglar made straight for the stairs john waters observing the light dashed up the same and the two met face to face on the landing breathing hate and glaring defiance end of chapter five Chapter Six of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter Six relates a stirring innocent. Now it was at this critical moment that I chanced to come upon the scene. I had just ascertained from the brass plate on the door that Doctor McTougall dwelt there, and was thinking what an ugly, unromantic name that was for a pretty girl, as I descended the steps, when Dumps's first yell broke upon my astonished ears. I recognized the voice at once, though I must confess that the second yell from the interior of the watering pan perplexed me not a little but the hideous clatter with which it was associated and the sudden bursting out of flames in the drawing-room drove all thoughts of dumps instantly away my first impulse was to rush to the nearest fire station but a wild shouting in the lobby of the house arrested me i rang the bell violently at the same moment i heard the report of a pistol and a savage curse as a bullet came crashing through the door and went pretty close past my head then i heard a blow followed by a groan this was succeeded by female shrieks overhead, and the violent undoing of the bolts, locks, and chains on the front door. Thought is quick. Burglary flashed into my mind. A villainous-looking fellow leaped out as the door flew open. I recognized him instantly as the man who had sold dumps to me. I put my foot in front of him. He went over it with a wild pitch, and descended the steps on his nose. I was about to leap on him when a policeman came tearing around the corner, just in time to receive the stunned Brassy with open arms as he rose and staggered forward. "'Just so. Don't give way too much to your feelings. I'll take care of you, my poor unfortunate fellow,' said the policeman as a brother in blue came to his assistance. Already one of those ubiquitous creatures, a street boy, had flown to the fire station on the wings of hope and joy, and an engine came careening around the corner as I turned to rush up the stairs, which were already filled with smoke. I dashed in the first door I came to. A lady, partially clothed, stood there pale as death and motionless. "'Quick, madame! Descend! The house is on fire!' I gasped in sharp sentences as I seized her. "'Where is your—' your she looked young sister i cried as she resisted my efforts to lead her out i've no sister she shrieked your daughter then quick direct me oh my darling she cried wringing her hands where i shouted in desperation for the smoke was thickening upstairs she screamed and rushed out intending evidently to go up I caught her round the waist and forced her down the stairs, thrust her into the arms of an ascending fireman, and then ran up again, taking three steps at a time. The cry of a child attracted me. I made for a door opposite and burst it open. The scene that presented itself was striking. Out of four cribs and a cradle arose five cones of bedclothes, with a pretty little curly head surmounting each cone and ten eyes blazing with amazement. A tall nurse stood erect in the middle of the floor with outstretched arms, glaring. Instantly, I grasped a cone in each arm and bore it from the room. Blinded with smoke, I ran like a thunderbolt into the arms of a gigantic fireman. "'Take it easy, sir. You'll do far more work if you keep cool. Straight on to the front room. Fire escape's there by this time.' 
I understood and darted into a front room through the window of which the head of the fire escape entered at the same moment, sending glass and splinters all over us. It was immediately drawn back a little, enabling me to throw up the window sash and thrust the two children into the arms of another fireman, whose head suddenly emerged from the smoke that rose from the windows below. I could see that the fire was roaring out onto the street and lighting up hundreds of faces below, while the steady clank of engines told that the brigade was busily at work fighting the flames. But I had no time to look or think. Indeed, I felt as if I had no power of volition properly my own, but that I acted under the strong impulse of another spirit within me. Darting back towards the nursery, I met the first fireman dragging with his right hand the tall nurse, who seemed unreasonably to struggle against him, while in his left arm he carried two of the children, and the baby by its nightdress in his teeth. I saw at a glance that he had emptied the nursery, and turned to search for another door. During the whole of this scene, which passed in a few minutes, a feeling of desperate anxiety possessed me as to the fate of the young lady to whom I had given up my doggy. I felt persuaded she slept on the same floor with the children and groped about the passage in search of another door. By this time, the smoke was so dense that I was all but suffocated. A minute or two more and it would be too late. I could not see. Suddenly, I felt a door and kicked it open. The black smoke entered with me, but it was still clear enough inside for me to perceive the form of a girl lying on the floor. It was she. "'Miss McTougall!' I shouted, endeavoring to rouse her, but she had fainted. Not a moment now to lose. A lurid tongue of flame came up the staircase. I rolled a blanket round the girl, head and all. She was very light." In the excitement of the moment, I raised her as if she had been a child, and darted back towards the passage. But the few moments I had lost almost cost us our lives. I knew that to breathe the dense smoke would be certain suffocation, and went through it, holding my breath like a diver. I felt as if the hot flames were playing round my head, and smelt the singeing of my own hair. Another moment, and I had reached the window, where the grim but welcome head of the escape still rested. With a desperate bound, I went head first into the chute, taking my precious bundle along with me. A fireman chanced to be going down the chute at the time, carefully piloting one of the maids who had been rescued from the attics, and checking his speed with outspread legs. Against him I cannoned with tremendous force, and sent him and his charge in a heap to the bottom. This was fortunate, for the pace at which I must have otherwise come down would have probably broken my neck. As it was, I felt so stunned that I nearly lost all consciousness. Still, I retained my senses sufficiently to observe a stout elderly little man in full evening dress, with his coat slid up behind to his neck, his face half blackened, and his shaggy hair flying wildly in all directions, chiefly upwards. Amid wild cheering from the crowd, I confusedly heard the conversation that followed. "'They're all accounted for now, sir,' said a policeman who supported me. The elderly gentleman had leaped forward with an exclamation of earnest thankfulness and unrolled the blanket. "'Not hurt! No, thank God! Lift her carefully now, to the same house. And who are you?' he added, turning and looking full at me as I leaned in a dazed condition on the fireman's shoulder. I heard the question and saw the speaker, but could not reply. "'This is the gentleman as saved two of the children and the young lady,' said the tall fireman, whom I recognized as the one into whose bosom I had plunged on the upper level. "'Ay, and he's the gentleman.' said another fireman, who shoved your missus, sir, into my arms when she was bent on running upstairs. Isn't this so, said the little gentleman, stepping forward and grasping my hand. Still, I could not speak. I felt as if the whole affair were a dream, and looked on and listened with a vacant smile. Just at that moment, a long, melancholy wail rose above the roaring of the fire and clanking of the engines. The cry restored me at once. "'Dumps! My doggie!' I exclaimed, and bursting through the crowd, rushed towards the now furiously burning house, but strong hands restrained me. "'What dog is it?' asked the elderly gentleman. 
a man drenched blackened and blood-stained whom i had not before observed here said a new dog sir dumps by name come to us this very day we put him in the scullery for the night again i made a desperate effort to return to the burning house but was restrained as before all right sir whispered a fireman in a confidential tone i know the scullery the fire ain't got down there yet your dog can only have been damaged by water as yet i'll save him sir never fear he went off with a quiet little nod that did much to comfort me meanwhile the elderly gentleman sought to induce me to leave the place and obtain refreshment in the house of a friendly neighbor who had taken in his family you need rest my dear sir he said come i must take you in hand you have rendered me a service which i can never repay what obstinate do you know that i am a doctor sir and must be obeyed i smiled but refused to move until the fate of dumps was ascertained presently the fireman returned with my doggie in his arms poor dumps he was a pitiable sight tons of hot water had been pouring on his devoted head and his shaggy shapeless coat was so plastered to his long little body that he looked more like a drowned weasel than a terrier he was trembling violently and whined piteously as they gave him to me nevertheless he attempted to wag his tail and lick my hands in both attempts he failed his tail was too wet to wag but it wriggled he'd have saved himself sir said the man who brought him only there was a rope round his neck which had caught on a coal scuttle and held him he's not hurt sir though he do seem as if someone had been trying to choke him my poor doggie said i fondling him he won't want washing for some time to come observed one of the bystanders there was a laugh at this come now the dog is safe you have no reason for refusing to go with me said the elderly gentleman who i now understood was the master of the burning house as we walked away he asked my name and profession and i thought he smiled with peculiar satisfaction when i said i was a student of medicine oh indeed he said well we shall see but here we are this is the house of my good friend dobson city man capital fellow like all city men <clears throat> He has put his house at my disposal at this very trying period of my existence. But are you sure, Dr. McTougall, that all the household is saved? I asked, becoming more thoroughly awake to the tremendous reality of the scene through which I had just passed. Sure, my good fellow. Do you think I'd be talking thus quietly to you if I were not sure? Yes, thanks to you and the firemen, under God, there's not a hair of their heads injured are you i beg pardon are you quite sure have you seen miss mctougall since she <laughs> miss mctougall exclaimed the doctor with a laugh do you mean my little jenny by that dignified title well of course i did not know her name and she is not very large but i brought her down the chute with such violence that an explosion of laughter from the doctor stopped me as I entered a large library, the powerful lights of which at first dazzled me. Here, Dobson, let me introduce you to the man who has saved my whole family and who has mistaken Miss Blythe for my Jenny. Why, sir, he continued, turning to me, the bundle you brought down so unceremoniously is only my governess ah i'd give twenty thousand pounds down on the spot if she were only my daughter my jenny will be a lucky woman if she grows up to be like her i congratulate you mr mellon said the city man shaking me warmly by the hand you have acted with admirable promptitude which is most important at a fire and they tell me that the header you took into the escape with miss blythe in your arms was the finest acrobatic feat that has been seen off the stage i say dobson where have you stowed my wife and the children i want to introduce him to them in the dining-room returned the city man you see i thought it would be more agreeable that they should all be together until their nerves are calmed so i had mattresses blankets etc brought down being a bachelor as you know i could do nothing more than place the wardrobes of my domestics at disposal of the ladies 
The things are not, indeed, a very good fit. But this way, Mr. Mellon. The city man, who was tall and handsome, ushered his guests into what he styled his hospital, and there, ranged in a row along the wall, were five shakedowns, with a child on each. Seldom have I beheld a finer sight than the sparkling luster of their ten still glaring eyes. Two pleasant young domestics were engaged in feeding the smaller ones with jam and pudding. We arranged the words advisedly, because the jam was, out of all proportion, too much for the pudding. The elder children were feeding themselves with the same materials, and in the same relative proportions. Mrs. McTougall, in a blue cotton gown with white spots, which belonged to the housemaid, reclined on a sofa. She was deadly pale, and the expression of horror was not quite removed from her countenance. Beside her, administering restoratives, sat Miss Blythe, in a chintz dress belonging to the cook, which was ridiculously too large for her. She was disheveled and flushed, and looked so pleasantly anxious about Mrs. McTougall that I almost forgave her having robbed me of my doggy. "'Miss Blythe, your deliverer!' cried the little doctor, who seemed to delight in blowing my trumpet with the loudest possible blast. "'My dear, your preserver!' I bowed in some confusion, and stammered something incoherently. Mrs. McTougall said something else, languidly, and Miss Blythe rose and held out her hand with a pleasant smile. "'Well, if this isn't one of the very jolliest larks I ever had!' exclaimed Master Harry from his corner, between two enormous spoonfuls. "'Ha!' exclaimed Master Jack. He could say no more. He was too busy. We all laughed, and, much to my relief, general attention was turned to the little ones. "'You, young scamps! The lark will cost me some thousands of pounds,' said the doctor. "'Never mind, Papa. Just go to the bank, and they'll give you as much as you want.' "'More pudding,' demanded Master Job. The pleasant-faced domestic hesitated. "'Oh, give it to him. Act the banker on this occasion, and give him as much as he wants,' said the doctor. "'Good, Papa!' exclaimed the overjoyed Jenny. "'How I wish we had a house on fire every night!' Even Dolly crowed with delight at this, as if she really appreciated the idea, and continued her own supper with increased fervor. Thus did that remarkable family spend the small hours of that morning while their home was being burned to ashes. End of chapter 6 Seven of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter 7 My Circumstances Begin to Brighten. Robin, said old Mrs. Willis from her bed in the wheeziest of voices. Who's Robin, Granny? demanded the young slider in some surprise, looking over his shoulder as he stooped at the fire to stir a pan of gruel. "'You are Robin,' returned the old lady, following up the remark with a feeble sneeze. "'I can't stand Slider. It's such an ugly name. Besides, you ought to have a Christian name, child. Don't you like Robin?' The boy chuckled a little as he stirred the gruel. "'Well, I ain't had it long enough to have made up my mind on the point. But you may call me what you please, Granny, so long as you don't swear.' I'll answer to Robin, or Bobbin, or Dobbin, or Nobbin, or Floggin. No, by the way, I won't answer to Floggin. I don't like that. But why call me Robin? Ah, sighed the old woman, because I once had a dear little son so named. He died when he was about your age, and your kindly ways are so like his that... Hello, Granny! interrupted Slider, standing up with a look of intense surprise. Are you took bad? No. Why? Cause you said something about my ways that look suspicious. Did I, Robin? I didn't mean to. But as I was saying, I'd like to call you Robin, because it reminds me of my little darling who is now in heaven. Ah, oh, Robin was so gentle and loving and tender and true and kind. He was a good boy. 
a wheezing which culminated in another feeble sneeze here silenced the poor thing for some minutes after that slider devoted himself to vigorous stirring of the gruel and to repressed laughter which latter made him very red in the face and caused his shoulders to heave convulsively at last he sought relief in occasional mutterings only think he said quoting mrs willis's words in a scarcely audible whisper so gentle and loving and tender and true and kind and such a good boy too and my kindly ways is like his are they well well mrs w it is quite clear that a lunatic asylum must be your native home after this what are you muttering about robin nothing particular granny only something about your future prospects the gruel's ready i think will you have it now or wait till you get it <laughs> there even your little touches of humor you're so like him said the old woman with a mingled smile and sneeze as she slowly rose to a sitting posture making a cone of the bedclothes with her knees on which she laid her thin hands come now old woman said slider seriously if you go on joking like that you'll make me larf and spill your gruel perhaps let it fall bash on the floor there don't let it tumble off your knees now i'd advise you to lower em for the time being here's the spoon it ain't as bright as i wish but you can't expect much of pewter and the napkin that's your sort and the bit of bread which isn't too much for a healthy appetite now then granny go in and win so like murmured the old woman as she gazed in slider's face and it is so good of you to give up your play and come to look after a helpless old creature like me yes it is very good of me assented the boy with an air of profound gravity i was used to sleep under a damp archway or in a wet cask now i slumbers in a house by a fire under a blanket once on a time i got vittles anyhow sometimes didn't get em at all now i have em regular as well as good and ought and what poets call the days gone by and nights too let me tell you i was kicked and cuffed by everybody and unted to death by bobbies now i'm let alone heavenly condition let alone sometimes even complimented with such pleasant greetings as go it ginger or does your mother know you're out oh yes granny i made great sacrifices i did when i come here to look arter you mrs willis smiled sneezed and began her gruel slider who looked at her with deep interest was called away by a knock at the door opening it he beheld a tall footman with a parcel in his hand does uh mrs willis live here he asked no replied slider a mrs willis doesn't live here but the mrs willis the only one worth speaking of does ah replied the man with a smile for he was an amiable footman and i suppose you are young slider i am mr slider sir and i would have you remember said the urchin with dignity that every englishman's house is his castle and that neither inference nor flunkies has a right to enter indeed exclaimed the man with affected surprise then i'm afraid this castle can't be a strong one or it ain't well guarded for inference got into it somehow when you entered good good returned the boy with the air of a connoisseur that's worthy of the east end you should have been one of us now then old six foot what's your business to deliver this parcel hand it over then but i'm also to see mrs willis and ask how she is walk in then and wipe your feet we ain't got a doormat today it's a comin like christmas but you may use the boards in the meantime the footman turned out to be a pleasant gossipy man and soon won the hearts of old mrs willis and her young guardian 
He had been sent, he said, by a Dr. McTougall, with a parcel containing wine, tea, sugar, rice, and a few other articles of food, and with a message that the doctor would call and see Mrs. Willis that afternoon. "'Deary me, that's very kind,' said the old woman. "'But I wonder why he sent such things to me, and who told him I was in one of them? It was a young gentleman who rescued most of the doctor's family from a fire last night. His name, I believe, is Mellon. What? Dr. John Mellon? exclaimed Slider with widening eyes. Whether he's John or doctor, I cannot tell. All I know is he's Mr. Mellon, and he's been rather knocked up by... Oh, but bless me, I forgot. I was to say nothing about the... the fire till Dr. McTougall had seen you. How stupid of me, but things will slip out. He stopped abruptly and placed his brown paper parcel on the bed. Now I say, look here, Mr. Six Foot, or whatever's your name, said Slider with an intense eagerness. It's of no use your tying up the mouth of the bag now. The cat's got out and can't be got in again by no manner of means. Just make a clean breast of it and tell it all out like a man. There's a good feller. If you don't, I'll tell Dr. McTougall that you gave me and the old lady a full, true, and particular account of the whole affair, from the first busting out of the flames and the calling of the engines to the last crash of the fallen roof and the roasting alive of the household cat. I will, as sure as you're a six-foot flunky. Thus adjured and threatened, the gossipy footman made a clean breast of it. He told them that I had acted like a hero at the fire, and then, after giving, in minute detail, an account of all that the reader already knows, he went on to say that the whole family, except Dr. McTougall, was laid up with colds, that the governess was in a high fever, that the maid servants, having been rescued on the shoulders of firemen from the attics, were completely broken down in their nerves, and that I had received an injury to my right leg which, although I had said nothing about it on the night of the fire, had become so much worse in the morning that I could scarcely walk across the room. In these circumstances, he added, Dr. McTougall had agreed to visit my poor people for me until I should recover. You see, continued the footman, I only heard a little of their conversation. Dr. McTougall was saying when I come into the room, well, Mr. Mellon, he said, you must of necessity remain where you are, and you could not, let me tell you, be in better quarters. I will look after your patients till you are able to go about again, which won't be long, I hope, and I'll make a particular note of your old woman and send her some wine and things immediately. I suppose he meant you, ma'am, added the footman, but having to leave the room again, owing to some of the children howling for jam and pudding, I heard no more. Having thus delivered himself of his tail and parcel, the tall footman took his leave with many expressions of good will. Now, Granny, remarked young Slider, as he untied the parcel and spread its contents on the small deal table, I've got a vague suspicion that the ouse which has gone to ashes is the very ouse in which Dr. Mellon put his little dog last night. Cause why? Ain't it the same identical street? and the same side of the street and what about the same part of the street and didn't both him and me forget to ask the name of the people of the house or to look at the number so took up was we with parting from punch what more natural than for him to go round on his way back to look at the house supposing he was too late to call then didn't that six-footer say a terrier dog was rescued from the lower premises to be sure, there's many a terrier dog in London, but then didn't he likewise say that the governess of the family is a pretty gal? What more likely than that she's my young lady? All that, you see, Granny, is what magistrates would call presumptuous evidence. But I'll go and inquire for myself this very evening, when you're all settled and comfortable, and when I got Mrs. Jones to look arter you. That evening, accordingly, when Robin Slider, as I shall now call him, was away making his inquiries, Dr. McTougall called on Mrs. Willis. She was very weak and low at the time. The memory of her lost Edie had been heavy upon her, and she felt strangely disinclined to talk. 
the kindly doctor did not disturb her more than was sufficient to fully investigate her case when about to depart he took mrs jones into the passage now my good woman he said i hope you will see the instructions you heard me give to mrs willis carried out she is very low but with good food and careful nursing may do well can you give her much of your time law sir yes i'm a lone woman sir with nothing to do but take care of myself and i'm that fond of mrs willis she's like my own mother very good and what of this boy who has come to live with her do you think he is steady to be depended on indeed i do sir replied mrs jones with much earnestness though he did come from nowheres particular and don't belong to nobody he's a good boy is little slider and a better nurse than you'll find in all hospitals i wish i had found him at home will you give him this card and tell him to call on me tomorrow morning between eight and nine let him ask particularly for me dr mctougall i'm not in my own house but in a friend's at present i was burnt out of my house last night oh sir exclaimed mrs jones with a shocked expression yes accidents will happen you know to the most careful among us mrs jones said the little doctor with a smile as he drew on his gloves good evening take care of your patient now i am much interested in her case because of the young doctor who visits her sometimes dr mellon exclaimed the woman yes you know him know him i should think i do he has great consideration for the poor ah he is a gentleman is mr mellon he's more than a gentleman mrs jones said the little doctor with a kindly nod as he turned and hurried away it may perhaps seem to savor of vanity and egotism my recording this conversation but i do it chiefly for the purpose of showing how much of hearty gratitude there is for mere trifles among the poor for the woman who was thus complimentary to me never received a farthing of money from my hands and i am not aware of ever having taken notice of her except now and then wishing her a respectful good evening and making a few inquiries as to her health that night dr mctougall came to me on returning from his rounds to report upon my district i was in bed at the time and suffering from considerable pain from my bruised and swollen limb dumps was lying at my feet dried refreshed and none the worse for his adventures i may mention that i occupied a comfortable room in the house of the city man who insisted on my staying with him until i should be quite able to walk to my lodgings as dr mctougall had taken my district a brief note to mrs miff my landlady relieved my mind of all anxieties professional and domestic so that my doggie and i could enjoy ourselves as well as the swollen leg would permit my dear young friend said the little doctor as he entered your patients are all going on admirably and as i mean to send my assistant to them regularly you may make your mind quite easy i've seen your old woman too and she is charming i don't wonder you lost your heart to her your young protege however was absent the scamp but he had provided a good nurse to take his place in the person of mrs jones i know her well said i she is a capital nurse little slider has i am told been here in your absence but unfortunately the maid who opened the door to him would not let him see me as i happened to be asleep at the time however he'll be sure to call again but you have not yet told me how miss blythe is well i've not had time to tell you replied the doctor with a smile i'm sorry to say she is rather feverish the excitement and exposure to the night air were a severe trial to her for although she is naturally strong it is not long since she recovered from a severe illness nothing however surprises me so much as the way in which my dear wife has come through it all it seems to have given her quite a turn in the right direction why she used to be as timid as a mouse now she scoffs at burglars after what occurred last night she says she will fear nothing under the sun isn't it odd as for the children i'm afraid the event has roused all that is wild and savage in their natures they were kicking up a horrible shindy when i passed the dining-room the hospital as dobson calls it 
so I opened the door and peeped in. There they were, all standing up on their beds, shouting, Fire! Fire! Police! Police! Engines! Escapes! Come quick! Silence! I shouted. Oh, Papa! they screamed in delight. What do you think we've had for supper? Well, what? Pudding and jam, pudding and jam, nearly all jam. Then they burst again into a chorus of yells for engines and fire escapes, while little Dolly's voice rang high above the rest. Pudding and dam, all dam, please, please, fire and thieves, as I shut the door. But now, a word in your ear before I leave you for the night. Perhaps it may not surprise you to be told that I have an extensive practice. After getting into a new house, which I must do immediately, I shall want an assistant, who may, in course of time, perhaps become a partner. Do you understand? Are you open to a proposal? My dear sir, said I, your kindness is very great, but you know that I am not yet. Yes, yes, I know all about that. I merely wish to inject an idea into your brain and leave it there to fructify. Now, go to sleep, my dear young fellow, and let me wish you agreeable dreams. With a warm squeeze of the hand and a pleasant nod, my new friend said good night and left me to my meditations. End of chapter 7